Hey everyone, in this video, we're gonna be doing a quick review of the concepts within the realm of ecology for AP Biology. Now this is typically the last unit taught in the AP Biology course if your teacher goes in the traditional order of teaching materials. So sometimes this part gets a little bit rushed, but I will say it does build on a lot of concepts that you might've learned in a previous high school biology class. So it may not be the most challenging unit for you. So if it has been rushed or you just need a quick review before the exam, this video is for you. Now within the ecology concepts that are taught in AP Biology, these are the main ones or the main categories of information that we're gonna be talking about. Now these three do have some equations that go with them and that you should be able to do and understand how to use before the AP Biology exam. I have a whole other video on how to do that population math, so I'll link that in the description below. So be sure to check that out if you wanna learn more about those equations. But this video is gonna be more conceptual and go over some of the ideas within this unit and not the math. So one of the main themes is how organisms respond to different things in the environment, whether that's a stimulus or whether that's a change in the environment like day to night or seasons. You might have covered photoperiodism which is how plants respond to the changing length of day and the changes that they undergo, such as how leaves change in response to seasonal changes of day length. Phototropism is how plants or other organisms can grow or orient themselves towards light, photo meaning light. But there's lots of other examples of how organisms respond to different changes in the environment. You are not required to memorize every different type of organismal response, but there are a few key examples that we're gonna go over. So I'm gonna highlight taxis and kinesis because these are two pretty common things that we can see in experiments. These are types of uh, movement behaviors that we're gonna see in organisms. So taxis is a movement toward or away from a particular stimulus. A lot of times it's light or a food source and it is directional. So in any type of taxis, whether it's chemotaxis or phototaxis or thermotaxis, the organism is either moving toward that stimulus or away from it. A lot of prokaryotic organisms will have chemotaxis, so these bacteria that can move towards this particular chemical stimulus. But you might have seen within an experiment with fruit flies, for example, there might have been some taxis behavior if you soaked a cotton ball in a particular sugar. Now kinesis, on the other hand, is still movement in response to a stimulus, but it's random movement, it's non-directional. So if there's high humidity within an environment with like a lot of pill bugs, they may not move around a lot because they're not maybe searching for water, but when an environment is more dry, you might see more random movement with these pill bugs. Okay, another theme here is that organisms change behavior within themselves or with other organisms in response to different cues. So for example, meerkats are a really popular example here. They have predator warnings where they produce sounds and call out to other meerkats if there is a predator nearby. We also use this example of the fight or flight response in different organisms where like in humans, for example, we have the amygdala that, that rapidly sends signals to the rest of the body. It's gonna increase uh, production of particular hormones like adrenaline in the body, pair the body to either run and flee a dangerous situation or to fight off something like predator or competitor. We also see can different behavioral responses in plants, whether that's producing different chemicals or over a long period of time, we see that plants that have high levels of caffeine in them. That's actually something that's toxic to insects that would be consuming them. So that's a plant's response to a particular herbivore. Now, just as a reminder, these are just examples. You do not need to go and memorize everything that I say in this video. In fact, it might be good to look at some different examples just to get more familiar with them for the AP Bio exam. But in general, we're gonna see that certain behaviors will affect the fitness of particular organisms. So the more successful a behavior is, the more likely that organism will survive, reproduce, and pass that on to their offspring. Especially if it is an innate behavior, one that they are born with, that they've inherited. Now, there are learned behaviors which parents can teach teach their offspring or offspring learn from other organisms. But often these types of behaviors are cooperative and they're gonna benefit other organisms within the same species. It's pack behavior, herding, flocking, schools of fish. Okay, getting into another topic, energy flow. This is big in the ecology unit. We know that organisms have different strategies for regulating body temperature, so a type of homeostasis. Uh, two main ones are endotherms and ectotherms, where endotherms use their metabolism, so thermal energy from their metabolism, to generate the warmth that helps them maintain homeostasis to the temperature that they need to be. Ectotherms, though, are dependent on the environment, so they can regulate their temperatures through behaviors like moving into the sun or moving into the shade, right? like lizards here sitting on a rock, which can help them regulate their internal body temperatures. Now, when we talk about energy availability, typically smaller organisms have higher metabolic rates, they have higher energy needs. So something like a fly or a small rodent is gonna have a higher metabolic rate than a larger organism like a cow, for example. And in general, obviously organisms consume 
other organisms to gain energy and a net gain of energy is going to result in growth for the organism and storage of energy and overall survival a net loss of energy we get a loss of math of mass of the organism and then later death for the organism this is a typical trophic or energy pyramid that you might see in a diagram for AP Biology. We have our producers or our autotrophs at the bottom. These are organisms that are going to get energy from the sun through chemical processes, photosynthesis. And then on the next level up, those are the primary consumers, the organisms that consume them. The next level up, we have the secondary consumers, tertiary consumers, and quaternary consumers. There's different types of pyramids too, like pyramids of biomass and pyramids of numbers. But here, what we're looking at are these different trophic levels or levels that that organisms feed at and we want to keep in mind that at every level we have a significant amount of energy lost so it is inefficient we have about a 90 percent energy lost every single time we go up a trophic level so it's more efficient uh, energy wise to consume at lower trophic levels but only about 10 percent of that energy is retained every time you go up a trophic level I already talked about photosynthetic organisms, which capture energy from the sunlight through chemical process we call photosynthesis. Chemosynthetic organisms capture energy from different or inorganic molecules in the environment. Typically, this is an anaerobic process. We'll see this, you know, deep ocean vents, places where we have little availability of sunlight. Heterotrophs then are our consumers. They're going to get their energy by consuming other organisms. They're going to get those their energy by breaking down molecules that are produced by other organisms. And they're going to go through their own metabolism, breaking down things like carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins to build their own bodies. Now we're going to get into those population ecology themes. A lot of the application of this is going to be in those math problems that we talked about. I'll go through those really quickly, but make sure to check out that other video I mentioned. In general, there's lots of factors that are gonna influence the growth of the population, but we'll see growth typically when the birth rate is larger than the death rate of a population. If we don't have any limiting factors, a population can grow exponentially and it'll grow in that kind of J curve. But if we have some sort of limiting factor or a particular resource that's going to limit the population growth, we'll see a logistic growth curve. So it'll increase, increase, increase until it reaches that, reaches that carrying capacity and kind of level out. There's also a lot of other factors like community structure, interactions, uh, energy availability that are going to determine how those populations will continue to grow and survive. So scientists like to measure communities in a variety of ways. And we can use mathematical models to investigate population growth patterns. With an exponential growth model, we assume that there's unlimited resources for the population. This is usually contrasted with the logistic growth model, or the model where we use carrying capacity. It's unlikely you'll see a problem on the AP Bio exam that asks you to just calculate population growth alone or exponential growth alone. More than likely, you'll have to apply ideas behind these two equations. We'll be able to recognize exponential growth as a type of growth due to a lack of limiting factors or when our reproductive or growth rate far exceeds the death rate of a population. Sometimes we'll see bacterial populations that can grow like this, but most populations in nature will reach carrying capacity eventually. We reach carrying capacity when the reproductive rate equals the death rate. Usually, this will stay the same as long as environmental conditions stay the same. We also have Simpson's Diversity Index to measure the diversity of a particular community based on different species numbers and population sizes. Okay, when we talk about the interactions of communities, though, there's different types of interactions like predator-prey or predation interactions, but we also have competition, different types of symbiosis. So on the AP Bio exam, you might be introduced to an example of a type of symbiosis or a type of relationship between organisms, and you may have to identify what that relationship is. Uh, we have ants and aphids here in the image, but make sure you can recognize a parasitic relationship. One organism is harmed, the other benefits or is helped. Mutualistic relationships where both organisms benefit in some way, or commensalistic relationship where one organism is helped and the other organism is relatively unaffected. Now, in general, remember the theme that the more biodiversity within a community or within in an ecosystem, the more resistant the community is to environmental change and we have a healthier ecosystem. So if there were a particular change in the environment, there'd be fewer organisms that would be able to res resist or survive those changes and likely we would see decreasing populations across the board. Keystone species are really important to ecosystems. Sometimes people refer to like the, well the wolves in Yellowstone Park, even though there's some argument about that. But the idea that the removal of one particular species from an ecosystem is going to have like really disproportionate effects on the entire ecosystem and affect lots of other species. And sometimes the ecosystem can collapse with the removal of that keystone species. Lastly, another theme within the ecology unit is disruptions. There's lots of different types of disru disruptions on ecosystems, but when there are disruptions, there are 
potentially ecosystem dynamics that get shifted. So for example, an introduction of an invasive species. These are non-native species that are harmful to the ecosystem where they're introduced. They don't have any natural predators and they typically survive really well, reproduce really well, and reproduce pretty quickly and to the detriment of other native species within an area. Introduction of new diseases is another disruption. A lot of times humans can unintentionally introduce a new disease into a particular ecosystem. Dutch Elms disease is a really popular example. There are tons of different habitat changes that human humans can cause, so make sure you're familiar with a few of them, like pollution, urbanization, deforestation. All of these are related to industrialization of areas and particularly what that's doing to habitat. Remember, the number one reason species become at risk of becoming endangered or extinct is habitat loss. So when habitats are fragmented, meaning they're separated by roads or part of a forest is cut down or there is a city or a town that's built in an area, we separate how organisms can interact. Or if we completely wipe out a habitat where organisms live, they have nowhere to grow and survive and hunt, and then the populations decrease. Geological events can also cause disruptions as well. Obviously, meteor impact on the dinosaurs is a big one, but any volcanic activity sometimes can result in changes to a local ecosystem. We can have other things like floods or erosion or other events that can occur and affect habitats and even the distribution of where different organisms live or entire ecosystems are. But ecosystems are always changing, local ones, global ones, over time. And we have evidence in the fossil record of ecosystems that were really different from long ago. So these are just a few important examples in our ecology unit for AP Biology. I hope this video has been helpful for you in your review. Thanks so much for watching. Give this video a like if it's been helpful and I'll see you later.